When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Welcome back to One Last Network and the Art of the Human-Animal Connection. The name comes from the book written by and the organization led by my guest today, Jeannie Joseph. Jeannie is a PhD certified in the trust technique practice in dog training and the creator of the Act Resilient Method, which combines drama and improv comedy to help lower stress and improve mental health in military personnel and their families. President Barack Obama presented her with the Silver Volunteer Service Award for this work. Jeannie believes resilience can be learned, not just in humans, but also in animals who have experienced trauma. She has rescued two badly abused dogs, Oscar and Sophia, and turned them into therapy dogs. She has over 2,000 hours of volunteer work in animal shelters, rescue centers, and sanctuaries. She does private consultations, conducts workshops and classes, and speaks to groups on communication, healing, and The Human-Animal Connection. Her recently released book, The Human-Animal Connection, explores that deep emotional bond we build with our companion animals. The book is divided into three parts. How to be a better human for your animal, what animals can teach us about being a happier human, and the spiritual connection, how humans can be of service to animals. Each part features a series of principles that teach us how our animals are trying to communicate with us and how we can open ourselves up to listen to them. Today, Jeannie and I talk about her work, the book, and the ways we as pet guardians can be better humans for their comfort, happiness, and health, which leads us doing better for our own comfort, happiness, and health. Have a listen. Author, Emmy award-winning film producer, adjunct professor, comedian, animal trainer, therapy dog team. Is there anything Jeannie Joseph doesn't do? I don't cook. (laughs) Yes, I was hoping that your answer would be something like the dishes or vacuuming, but that's (laughs) That's a little about yourself, Jeannie. Yeah, we're really happy to be with you. Thanks for having me. I am Jeannie Joseph. I'm the executive director of the Human Animal Connection and author of the book by the same name, which I know we're going to chat about as we do this show. And I also have worked with over 4,000 service members with a method that I created called Act Resilient, which uses improv comedy and laughter, expressive arts to help people heal from PTSD. And what I discovered in doing that work, which was over 80% effective in reducing the symptoms of PTSD, I started bringing the therapy animals into the program. And what I saw that a dog could do in 10 minutes was amazing. I'm like, why am I working so hard? (laughs) (laughs) Because these, uh, you know, I had this wonderful dog. I rescued him. This is when I lived in Hawaii. I rescued him. He had been in the shelter a long time and he had been literally a prisoner of war. It was unfortunate. He was in a horrible situation where they forced these dogs, these pit pit bulls to be wild boar hunters and they starved them to make them more aggressive. And so this dog had scars everywhere, missing teeth and scars all over his body. And of course, the soldiers just loved him because he had this sweet, sad face and they could really relate to this being who had an, an amazing escape and just a, a incredible story of escape <laughs> ended up in the shelter and I got him fortunately and he was the best therapy dog I've ever known he just he could sit in a circle of soldiers like a room full of soldiers with PTSD and hospitalized soldiers and he would say hello to everyone but he knew exactly who was in the most trouble, who was suicidal. And he had 101% accuracy in terms of really sensing 
who really needed the attention in that moment. And he would do what's called an alert, which means he would sit in front of the person and he would just stare at them until they just melted and petted him. <laughs> he would not relent until they started loving and laughing. And, and you know, it was just an amazing thing to watch, you know, this being who could sense strangers what they were feeling and it's you know i work with him with kids with adults with doctors with nurses with you know soldiers and it was just extraordinary to see a level of healing beyond words and you know what was his name was oscar i named him oscar after the awards <laughs> what what was it that he could sense that told him you know like oh i'm nice to everybody and he could tell if someone was afraid he would just pass them right by if they weren't a dog person but and he would be nice to everyone but that one person he was like you're my person for this hour and you know that person would get down on the floor and cuddle and laugh and just you know their hearts would open you know the shell would melt and that really got me that said all right this is it this is my life's work <laughs> and so now we have the human animal connection so we still do act resilience hit but uh the human animal connection is really our main focus and we have a couple of programs. We go into high schools. We have a program called Canines Teach Compassion. And we bring the dogs to work with kids who are in counseling and, you know, going through different issues. As you know, teens are just having an incredibly rough time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has said that there's an epidemic of loneliness in that age group. And we think of them as being so social, they're on social, whatever, but track, they're really feeling very lonely, very isolated. And part of the problem is that they haven't learned good social skills person to person. They are, you know, so much of the interactions for so long with COVID and everything was online, et cetera. And they just are lacking skill sets. And we use the dogs not just for petting and cuddling, although we do that too, but we use the dogs to help them really understand their own emotions and understand how dogs communicate and to recognize how they, they their own emotions. So we teach them a, a scale. We teach them a 10 scale. Like 10 is like a dog at a 10 would be like dangerous. You're going to get bit. Someone's going to get hurt. We never want to see that, but it happens in the shelter, especially, right? Um, and one is completely peaceful. So we teach them how to recognize these different levels of stress or activation in the animals, which they get very good at in one session. They're absolutely within one point of accuracy uh, with behavior. And then we show them that that's the same thing for them. Mm -hmm. So it helps them to recognize their own stress levels as they're beginning to rise. And then we can have a whole conversation about what is it that causes you to feel more stress? What is it that reduces your stress? Because a lot of people don't even know, you know, I mean, they don't, they sort of know, but they don't really know what it is that's triggering them and what's causing them to react. And when they see it in the dogs, and again, we're not even asking them anything about their personal life. We're just saying, well, where is that dog right now? You know, well, what caused that dog to go from a three to a seven? Oh, is that noise over there or that person rustling that bag or something happened? And they can begin to see the connection between emotions in a dog and emotions in themselves. And we also help them because they learn to train. Uh, we, we bring dogs to class that are not only trained and certified, but also dogs that are still in training that haven't yet passed the test. And the kids help us train them. So they learn some basic things. Like one simple thing we'll do is, is how to jump through a hoop, which may sound completely obvious to a human, but it's not a natural thing for a dog to jump through a hoop, right? So um, they'll the see like- Collies just don't know. Right, exactly, <laughs> right? So my dog, Sophia, who's done it, because she's done it in class several times, she was a rescue and she, uh, I met her at the shelter and she had been a feral dog. So she was, she used to scare grown men. Okay, let's put it that way. She was terrifying. And uh, now she's, of course, been totally rehabilitated and she's my perfect little therapy dog, goes into class. She's the sweetest, calmest thing. People can't believe that grown men were scared of her, but they were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I had to have a maintenance man come to the house, I had to strap her to my waist and we had to sit on the couch and <laughs> I had to mobilize her because they would they would they didn't want to come to the door. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> What is the trust technique? The trust technique was developed by James French, and he is in England, and he is one of my mentors. He just does amazing work. And one of the things that he discovered was that 
you can't go in and heal an animal, you know, do energy work or anything else until the animal feels safe, until the animal has a sense of trust. So what we find is when animals have been traumatized or they've had some negative experiences, their trust gets broken or eroded. And so our first step in working with them is to restore trust. And his method is all about this way that we as humans can begin a process of restoring trust in an animal. And that has to do with us being very peaceful and safe to be around. And we may think, oh, I'm safe. I love this animal or I'm a good person. That makes me safe. It doesn't necessarily make you safe. What makes you safe is that you communicate in dog language or horse language or whatever animal you're working with, that you are safe through the way you behave. So for example, dogs, animals are communicating all the time with body language. And if we are not aware of what the body language means, we might inadvertently give an animal a message that we're not safe. And so it's very much about observation and learning to see what can I do. So for example, when I'm volunteering in a shelter with a dog that's very shy and traumatized and maybe hiding in the corner in their, in their kennel and I, I go in, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to look at them. I'm not going to touch them. I'm going to sit as far away as possible in a tiny kennel, <laughs> but I'm going to sit as far away as possible and I'm going to be very still and I'm going to get my mind into a very peaceful place. And that is very attractive to an animal. It's very polite to not approach, to, for just me to be still and let the animal choose to come to me, which is a really important step because when an animal makes a choice, they're exercising their free will, which they get very little of in the shelter, they begin to move into the curious brain instead of the fear brain. So anything that I can do that elicits their choosing, their curiosity begins a process of trusting. So then I'll take out a, a kind of stinky treat from my hand, like a, you know, a chicken or hot dog or whatever, cheese or whatever I have. And I'm just going to offer it out in my hand. I'm not going to um, make a big move. If the animal comes to me, great. I know that they're beginning to develop the trust that they can trust me as a, a trustable person. If they're not ready, I'll toss that treat near them where they have to make a little bit of movement. Because again, movement uh, deactivates the freeze response, the stress, the fight or flight. So getting them to make a little bit of a move by tossing that treat just near their nose, maybe a little, uh, you know, a few, few inches from their feet. So they have to just move a little bit, gets them going. And then they're like, okay, they start using their nose. And I have this theory that when animals are traumatized, like in the shelter environment, they're smelling too much. Their noses are like, I've had enough. And they, the nose starts to shut down. And then they start relying on all the sounds they're hearing, all the barking, all the movement of people, their vision. So now what happens is I believe their senses get out of order, at least temporarily, in that environment. And so what I want to do is elicit the nose first. That's why I don't talk and don't move, because I don't want them getting too much activation from their ears or their eyes. I want them really going, oh, she's got treats on her. This smells good. And to get their nose going, because when the dog gets their puts their nose first like on a sniff walk when they're sniffing this and sniffing that they're really doing like it's like a chiropractic adjustment they're they're getting their senses in order mm. and so as they start getting their senses in order the fear goes down and the trust can come back up i'm a twice certified grief coach ah. and while this may sound overly simplistic in thinking that doesn't sound remarkably different from what I've learned in how to work with humans mm -hmm. who are traumatized by grief and pain. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because we want to get people into their senses. Yeah. Um, because the grief, what happens with the grief, and it's completely natural, but it pulls us back. It pulls us backwards, backwards, backwards into the memory, worry about the future, et cetera, et cetera. It pulls us away from the present. And what the senses do is they bring us back to right here, right now. So in this moment, you know, like the grief is uh, un, unbearable, unimaginable when you're thinking about the meaning of it. But when you're just in the moment, it is tolerable. You know, like in just this between second one and second two, it's tolerable. And then between second one and second three, it's tolerable if you're focusing on your senses. So that could be anything that brings you pleasure, like for a human, you know, like nice music or, you know, being in a beautiful place and allowing the place to touch you. 
So in other words, you don't have to touch the place, the place, just let the place in. And that could be even with, you know, if you if you have other humans that make you feel good, if you could let them in, you know, just to let them touch you, not necessarily physically, but touch your heart, to touch your emotions, to touch your spirit, your soul, that begins to bring you into present time. And animals are usually good at that, usually very good. That's why it feels so good to be with them, because they are in present time. But when they get traumatized, just like us, they get knocked out of present time. They're worried about what's going to happen, or they're thinking about what already did happen. So they can get knocked out of present time, just like us. It's a fallacy to think that they're always in present time. Mm -hmm. They're mostly in present time, because they have less thinking and more sensing. So that brings them into present moment. So we can learn from animals how they handle grief. Animals do grieve. There's no question that animals grieve, as you know. <laughs> I'm saying to the choir, you know this. Um, but they have the capacity to um, emerge back into the present through the through the sensory path. So it's very important to stay, uh, if animals are grieving, to give them opportunities to be touched, you know, depending upon what the animal likes. I mean, you're not going to touch an animal doesn't like touching, but if an animal likes touching, touching is a really good way to help them come back. And this is not necessarily the petting touch I'm talking about. It might be the leaning touch. It might be the proximity like puppies do where they all lie together. And you want to create a very gentle compression, like like puppies in a, in a huddled together would give each other a sense of compression, like a weighted blanket kind of feeling. And that is um, really good for animals to help come back into their body and, you know, other types of soothing touch that are not quite like petting. They sort of look like petting, but they're a little different and they're they're more present and they're slower, you know, it's a very slow and we're connecting the head to the tail. So I'll, I'll start a, a hand motion at, my, at the head and I'll very, very slowly, like 10 seconds to go down the whole body down towards the tail, according to what the animal likes. I mean, I'm always paying attention to what they like, but these kinds of things are ways to get the animal reconnected with their body and their senses, which helps them move through a grief process more efficiently. We have this um, workshop that we do called the sense of safety, the sense of mm -hmm. safety. And what this is about is that helping humans do what I just told you we do for the animals, which is to really get them into the present moment. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel right here, right now in your body? And wherever you are, whether you're in your office or you're in nature, wherever, you're lucky if you're in nature, but if you're in your office, it's just maybe there's an image on the wall, like that beautiful white dog behind you, you know, can just bring me some joy because I just see that little smile on his face and those eyes and he just looks very happy in that moment. And if I tune in, you know, connect with that experience, I can let go of the a piece of the grief. I'm not saying I'm going to let go of all the grief in a second, but this habit of returning to the senses instead of the mind is where healing will occur. That, that picture you're referring to, uh, I took of my Bella in Banff National Park uh -huh. uh, on a memorial trip for the fifth year anniversary of losing my first boy, Shep. Uh -huh. And that portrait transports me back to that day yeah. when I realized she was my dog and I was her human. Yeah. And I smell the air and oh. I hear the birds. Yeah. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> no, it's, it's lovely. It's it, it's exactly what we're talking about is yeah. this is this is our pathway, you know, and you know, grief is, is a natural emotion. Animals feel it, humans' emotions. It's good to good to cry. Thank you for crying. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's lovely, you know. It's, it's, it's not crazy to think that we all experience similar emotions, humans, dogs, cats, horses, et cetera, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been working with this wonderful donkey that we're training to be a therapy donkey. And one day I was with him and there are two other donkeys next door in the kennel in the corral next door. And I made the mistake of talking about the other donkeys. I said something really nice about the other donkeys. And I swear to you, this donkey, his name is Don Quixote, got jealous. You could just see it, you know, just like his head went down. He looked like, what about me? I just look, you know, you know, and it was like, okay, I love you too. You are the best. You know? 
but they, they have emotions. I mean, it, it's 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 not exactly the same as human emotions, but it is so similar. It's more similar than it is dissimilar. Let's put it that way. I mean, human emotions. What happens when we have grief? We think, oh my God, I'll I'll never be alone. I'll never have another dog like that, or no one will ever love me like that. I mean, it gets really complicated and so for animals it, it isn't as complicated but it still exists it's still the emotions the pure emotions still exist and there's like a saying that if you have any doubt that animals can count put two treats in your pocket and you know let them see two treats in your pocket give them one and they just sit there and wait for the other one you know <laughs> or you give one treat to one dog you know i always say you have to co-treat you know you have to treat equally if you have two because they feel it you know, they feel it. Like, why is one dog getting something that I'm not getting? I mean, you know, you can't deny that experience, that emotional experience. So now on to your just released book, The Human Animal Connection. Yeah. It's it's foundational in teaching us to communicate better with our animals. What do we gain by learning to do that? We get more in sync. It's the same thing with humans. Like if, if you have a uh, a human that speaks a language that you don't understand, you're going to struggle to try to make your needs met, to try to feel seen and heard and understood. But once you are communicating, you know, when communication is working, it's much more cooperation. So you get this feeling of like a dance when you're cooperating, when you're communicating well and everything, you're kind of moving together. And that's true on the walk. That's true in the house. It's true wherever you are. When you get out of sync, it's like the animal wants one thing and you want something different. You want to go left. The animal wants to go right. You know, it starts to get out of sync and, and you know, we, a little of that we can all handle, but when it becomes chronic, then there's no understanding between each other about what's wanted and desired. And so it, it's based upon mutual respect. I mean, you you can't communicate with an animal if you don't respect their desires. It doesn't mean that they're going to get everything they want. They're not going to get a treat 24-7, you know, But because we're still the grown-up. But if you have a, we're talking about domestic pets, you're still the grown-up. But the fact is, if we recognize what they want and acknowledge it, um, whether or not they're going to get it, things get a little better. It's like, I know you want to go left, but we have to go right is, is something they can cope with. You know, just like humans, if I explain to you, I know we said we'd meet at nine, but I have this thing and I have to meet at 10. You go, okay. But if I just don't show up, that's no good. Right. So, so it's the same thing with the animals. If you just don't show up in terms of recognizing their wants and needs, they will stop communicating to you. They will stop telling you, I need to go out now, you know, if yeah. you don't pay attention to those signals. So they learn very quickly who's listening, who's not, who's attending, who's not. I think one of the things that comes up when you're talking about that is that it dispenses with the master-slave relationship between human and dog, and that an animal needs to submit and serve. How do we take that message and turn it into gospel for society writ large? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, humanity has a long and tortured history with animals in terms of, you know, using them, abusing them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've got this is our mission is to change the way humanity relates to animals. So that's our whole entire focus. It's no small thing, but it is beginning to happen in the sense that you and I are having this conversation. We understand it and your listeners understand it. And if your listeners can help talk to somebody else, it's kind of like that. You know, we we just have to do it person by person. And when we, you know, when stories like with Oscar and Sophia, Sophia is now you know, can go into this classroom and just melt hearts, you, you know, so when people understand, you know, really the gifts of their understanding, it's like impossible to treat them as as just pets, the things that we own, or that we need to dominate or control, you know, I mean, remember Caesar Milan, you know, he had that whole, I mean, he he's wonderfully gifted as a human being with animals, I've seen him in person, he, what he does with animals is amazing, but he has some terrible misconceptions about this notion of having to dominate, which was not based on the science. It was, you know, those study, those, that information came from wolves in captivity, not from seeing wolves in the wild. Wolves in the wild are enormously cooperative. Mm -hmm. They are enormously um, willing to harmonize rather than fight because they know that a fight will be often a fight to death. Somebody's going to die. 
And they are wired not to fight, actually. They can menace. They can say, ah, you know, and scare, you know, they'll certainly be put on a display. But they're really not interested in fighting because somebody's going to die in a wolf fight. And so the truth is, is that wolves are very affiliative, meaning they connect and they are very, they work as a pack, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, they, we have to teach humans every you know, this podcast and all the good work that people understand this are doing to help educate people that we are at the very least equals. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes I think animals are even smarter than us. They, you know, the ways in which they are certainly ways in which they're smarter, right? You know, not just more emotionally intelligent than some humans. Yeah, exactly. You know, they have better social skills. Um, if they haven't been traumatized, of course, if they didn't get what they need as puppies, you know, they may be lacking in social skills, just like humans can be. And if they are agitated, you know, they can have ADD too. They can be, you know, they can have different things. So it's not like all animals are um, in a state of bliss all the time. But the fact is, is that they are much more capable of, being here, being present, and choosing love and cooperation over conflict. And that's where the good communication comes in, is that we raise the level of understanding and connection and lower the amount of stress and and, and conflict over competing needs. I believe that my dogs have been my greatest teachers Yes, on this crazy life journey what are some of the greatest lessons you've learned from animals? So, so, so much. I mean, my whole book is all about the lessons that I've learned from animals. The whole book was created from my experience with animals. And it was literally the birds that gave me the title and the structure of the book, you know, hanging out with wild birds in the yard. Um, Yeah. So, there, there's so many ways that they have taught me things. And I'm just running through some of the different stories in my brain to think about what to do. Oh, let me tell you about this one horse named Blue. And then he was a 40-year-old horse, which is, as you know, not, not usual. Most horses don't live that long. He's in a w- wonderful place with people who give him all holistic care and holistic footwork and all this good stuff. So um, uh, he, we were, I was doing a session with him, communication session with him and his people. And he was showing me some of the ways that he does healing work. And it was so profound. It was like, it was, he literally took me to the edge of what I could comprehend, you know, in terms of showing me, well, when I stand this way or I move this way or I, I'm standing in this way perpendicular to a horse, it's not arbitrary. He said, I'm doing energetic work with the field lines of the earth, literally the electromagnetic fields of the earth. I mean, he was showing me stuff that was like, beyond anything that I was understanding or thinking, you know, just looks like horses moving, but no, he was showing me that it was purposeful. And so he took me on this like glorious, like mind bending experience of showing me the way that he does healing work. And then at the end of the session, and as I often do with clients, I say, is there anything else you'd like your humans to know? And he said, just pause for one second. He said, I would like more treats. It was so funny because first of all, they don't give them, they don't, you know, can't just give them carrots. They're only organic treats, whatever they, they were, he gets treats, but they're restricted. You know, he doesn't get as money as he'd like. So it showed me uh, what was so interesting about that experience was that he could be in this like Zen monk state of teaching me. And then uh, the next second, the most basic level of, I want more treats. Do you know what I mean? And it showed me that people, you know, people and animals are not just like, at a single level, we exist at many levels. So we have like our highest self and our lowest self and everything in between simultaneously existing. And it was such a great lesson for me to get out of this idea of thinking of, oh, this animal's very evolved or this animal's not very evolved. I mean, not that I really thought that, but it's, you know, you fall into those thinking things. Like I did with the donkeys, complimenting two in front of the other one. (laughs) It's just like, you don't do that, okay? (laughs) So, but the point being is that he gave me a very profound lesson not just about that, him and his experience, but about all animals and about all beings is that we all have the potential to kind of be at our highest level at some moments and other level times at our lowest and everything in between. And that is the nature of consciousness. You know, that consciousness is not just one level, one experience, like people are not all good or all bad or all anything, right? So they're, they're moving along a spectrum according to 
the situation, the choices that they make, the resources that they have. So, yeah, I mean, that was just one thing. I mean, I've had a number of like knock me on my derriere experiences where animals really talked to me. I felt like I had met the Buddha in that moment, you know, or whoever you want to put in that, you know, it just was so profound and and what's interesting about blue is very blue is very funny he will um, obviously i talk to animals right so he will only talk to me when i am in my highest state so if i'm just kind of an ordinary consciousness he's like not talking but if i get to that kind of place that he likes you know that kind of very you know my highest sort of ability at the moment then he just opens up and teaches me things about, you know, what's going on in my life or whatever else. So it becomes a very rich world. I mean, if you're not talking to animals, you're really missing out. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get to that higher state? Is it a is it a, a process of centering yourself? And how do we get there as well? Yeah, you? exactly right. So it's it's a training. It's a muscle, um, you know, like so the more you practice it, the stronger it gets. It is like your intuition, a little bit different, but it is like that centered, calm, peaceful, intuitive, loving, open place that we don't spend much time in because daily life takes us into like, what do I have to do now? And, you know, pulls us into the spin of life, which we all get pulled into. But every now and then, if we can take a moment every day and just kind of like it, sometimes I wake up at three in the morning and I don't like waking up at three in the morning, but I know that that's my time. I need to kind of just tune into the animal kingdom and just practice being in that quiet place until I fall back to sleep. So, you know, you, you work it into your life, but, you know, with the trust technique, this is what we have been trained for. You know, we train for this. So we do it. So thousands of hours of practice have got to me to where I am. So um, it, it does take practice, but it, you know, it's the first thing is the intention, the desire. It starts with the intention and desire to do to do it like with anything else. And then it's the willingness to accept that it might be true. You don't have to know that it's true. I know you're a skeptic, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with being skeptical. <laughs> as long as the skepticism doesn't cloud over your experience too much. Right. So if you say, okay, well, Jeannie does this, maybe I could do it too, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm just a regular person, <laughs> you know, so any person with the true heart and desire to do it and willingness to not impose your own thoughts can do this. So the trick is the biggest challenge for people learning animal communication is self-doubt is the thought, I can't do this. That's for so-and-so who's this expert and charges four thousand dollars a second to do it you know that person could do it but i can't do it well that's not true you first of all you're doing it you do do it you just don't always realize that you are doing it right but you get you get senses from your animals you feel like they're talking to you you feel like they understand you right yeah yeah right? well and so, i have conversations with bella all the time my husband thinks i'm talking to him and i'm like no i'm not talking to you uh-huh well, there you go <laughs> There you go. Exactly right. Well, keep doing that. I mean, one of my top blogs is sing to your dog. So that's, you know, even for people who don't feel like they can have this kind of conversation like you and I are having, um, you can converse with your dog, you can sing to your dog, you can, you can do that. And they may not understand all the words, but they understand the emotion, they understand the energy, they understand the intention, they know your heart. So if you're saying, this is principle number one. The first principle in our book is is the power of goodness, which is the ability to, when you say, oh, you're such a good doggy, good doggy. Not only is the dog feeling good, but you're feeling good. It makes you feel good to feel the goodness in your dog. So it becomes this lovely circle of energy going around back and forth, a circle of goodness between you and the animal because you're in appreciation, you're in love, you're in sweetness, you're in that beautiful childlike place, you know, and the dog feels that and they reflect it back to you. And the next moment when you're sad, they're right there with you because you filled them up with this goodness and they've got now goodness to share. Are you familiar with the high five method? No. Um, I can't remember the name of the gal who Ted talks about it, but you're supposed to wake up in the morning and, and say something nice to yourself and high five yourself in the mirror. Uh -huh. And to me, it feels ridiculous. Yeah, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but, but. but Jeannie Joseph, 
Yeah. Right before I got onto this call, mm -hmm. I laid on the floor and I held Bella's paws and mm -hmm. I said, good girl. Yes. Good girl. And yeah. then I said, good Angela. Yes. And that's I, exactly it. That's the exercise in the I book. You just, it's like you read my book because that's the exercise is to say, <laughs> yeah, good Bella, good Angela, you know, good Sophia, good Jeannie. And it creates, some people are like embarrassed to do it, you know, to do it out loud if you're shy, but it's that feeling of goodness that you are aware of the goodness in the animal. You see it in them. They acknowledge it. They love that. All you have to do in a shelter is go feel the goodness of the dog you're with. Mm -hmm. And they, their hearts just open. They respond so quickly to that. And we respond. I used to go and, you know, sit there with the dog for 45 minutes. I would come out feeling better because I had been giving love, feeling, you know, appreciation for this being in front of me. And I get twice as much in return. Yeah. It, it felt so much more authentic than leaving motivational post-it notes on my oh God, yes. computer or yeah. so thank you because I've learned just so much in the first 50 pages of your book oh good <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in it you write animals don't doubt their self-worth as much as humans do mm -hmm. and I know our mutual friend Maureen Scanlon of I never knew but my dog did would squeal with delight at those words yes. Can we learn to improve our self-worth by understanding what our animals are trying to tell us? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's why Oscar was so healing for the soldiers. He loved them no matter what they looked like, what the color of their hair was, if they were missing any limbs, the scars meant nothing to him. What meant something to him was their heart, their, their soul that, you know, and so when a being acknowledges you, it changes you. And when you acknowledge a being, it changes them. We had one little boy in the class, you know, he was 13 years old, but much smaller than all the other high school students. He maybe had skipped a grade or something. So he was developmentally, socially not ready to be in high school, but he was. And very, very shy, didn't talk at all, probably weighed about 80 pounds, you know, a little tiny thing, a little wisp. And we had this 130 pound bull mastiff as one of our therapy dogs. And therapy dogs are not allowed to lick as part of their, you know, they're not allowed to be lickers, you know, so that's one of the things that they're you know, don't do as, as therapy dogs, but this bull mastiff, and he's never done it before. He took one look at this boy and he started to lick him and he licked him and he licked him. And, and this dog is twice the weight of this boy. And this boy just started giggling. And after that, he never used to talk after that. You couldn't shut him up, you know, because this dog picked him out of the whole group of kids. He saw this dog interact with other kids. He was friendly to everyone. Everyone liked it and all nice, but he just licked him. <laughs> and licked them and licked them and licked them you know and it was like it was funny i mean everyone was laughing and everybody saw that this dog said this is a special boy this is my boy and that changed everything in the in the dynamics in the class you know because the students had seen this dog select this boy <laughs> as his <laughs> it's tremendous it's so sweet since this podcast was founded on the subject of preparing for the awful inevitability of losing our pets, many of our listeners are in the anticipatory grief stage of their pets' lives. How can learning to communicate better with their animals now bring them comfort and healing in the days, months, and years that follow that inevitable pain and sorrow? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, this was even before I really understood animal communication. I had a cat that I was completely attached to. I mean, just like, you know, how we all get. I mean, it wasn't just a pet. It was like my soul, mm -hmm. my soul cat, you know, and uh, her name was, was uh, I mean, his name was Wolfie. And because I was thinking about another cat, too, but uh, Wolfie, Wolfie was um, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He was a rescue from New York City. He had been on the streets of New York City. Anyway, um, it was time, you know, we knew with the veterinarian had told time is coming. And I, it, well, first of all, let me just go back. He told me two years before that it was time that he was going to be leaving in, in, in two years. And then as we were getting very, very close, he told me what night he was going to go. He said, I'm going to go between 3.30 and 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he went at 3.30, you know, so I was prepared because he told me when he was going to go. I did with him. I didn't want to do the euthanasia, which was what the vet was suggesting. I, I asked him what he wanted. He said, I want to go home. 
and be with you and go on my own. So I, I was able to literally dialogue with him and find out his requests. And so in the passing, um, of course, it was, you know, wildly sad, but I felt like I had honored his wishes exactly, you know, like I had really listened. So for me, that was really, really helpful. And of course, I have a lot of clients who are in this time where the vet has said it's time or whatever, or they're feeling, wondering if it's time. So they're in that cycle. And I have to say that 80% of the time, the animals say, yeah, I'm ready. You know, that, 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 um, I would like to go. And the only thing they're worried about is the human, the sadness of the human. And that's why they're hanging on. So it is very, very helpful if you can dialogue with the animal. And it's difficult when it's your own animal because we're so, you know, racked with, with sadness ourselves that it's hard to hear what the animal is actually feeling and thinking. But the truth is, is that animals, no animal wants to die. They're not suicidal like we humans get, but, but they, when they know it's time, they have an acceptance that really could transform us if we, if we could master what they understand about that process. They accept death as a natural part, just as life is a natural part. It's, it's in the same category and they, they don't see it as exactly the same, but they have an appreciation for the next the nextness of death. In other words, for them, it's not the end. For the humans, we're like, oh my God, how am I going to live without my dog or my cat here with me? So we can't conceive of the horror of this thing that was the center of our life not being there anymore um, is hard for us. But knowing that they can have peace in the experience. And I think if you're going to do euthanasia, if you can handle it, you should be there. You know, it's very, very important to look, you know, to have the animals, the last person, you know, to see your eyes is is important. Now, not everyone can handle that, I understand. So I'm not, I don't want to make anyone feel guilty. But if you can, um, it is good to do. And if you can communicate or you have a trusted communicator to check in with the animal and see what they are feeling, thinking and hoping for. And also I believe that you can communicate with animals after they pass. I've many clients I've in my own, you know, uh, the relationship becomes, it continues in a way that's glorious. It is not, of course, we all miss the contact and the presence and the habit and the, you know, no way you can't not miss it. But the, the, the other side, the silver lining is the beauty of connection. When they're not in a body, they are quite capable of communicating very, very, you know, that they're, they, cause they're evolving, right? Their souls are evolving. And so in their process of, uh, and it, again, usually it takes a couple of days. I don't try to talk to an animal for three days after they pass, give them a chance to settle in, <laughs> you know, but, but I, um, but it becomes like, it's so refined and precise and accurate and simple and joyous that that is the, um, the, the compensation to use a word for the the grief and pain and loss because there's no short there's no way to not have that you know even if, even as I know what I know I'm going to be sad if Sophia passes you know or whatever you know there's there's no we don't get a free pass out of that we still have to experience it but we don't have to dwell and suffer and you know have our lives derailed by it you know we need the time that we need and everybody's timing is different but all the animals that I've talked to have said, get another dog, get yeah. another dog. you know? And so what they want is for us to learn to love, feel the pain and love again. Yeah. That's what they want. They're not like, Oh, you're going to be disloyal if you love another dog. Nope. That's not true. <laughs> They're like, love me. Remember I'm special. You know, you can love me the most. You can love me the best, but you know, when you're ready, get another dog and love again. And that's part of their sort of soul contract in our human lives is to help us to love more deeply, more fully, to lose, to experience loss, and to choose to love again when you're ready. You know, the, no, no rule that says you got to run out the next day, you know, but when you're ready, um, and of course, sometimes depending upon where you live, the animals come to you, like a lot of the animals. You know, so when I, Sophia came to me, I was, I had just moved to Tucson. I didn't have an apartment yet. 
and I was volunteering in a shelter and people whose house, my friends that I was staying with, they said only one rule, no animals. That was their one rule. <laughs> Bad rule. <laughs> but no animals, right? And so I didn't have an apartment. So I was volunteering and Sophia, who was, you know, half of the, she's 25 pounds now, but she was, you know, half of that literally when I first met her at the shelter. She was being dragged along by the shelter worker. She'd been through four shelters already. And she took one look at me and leapt into my arms. Like she leapt into my chest, just assuming that I would catch her, which I did. <laughs> but she sort of made the choice for me. I. <laughs> As you know, some dogs will do that when you yeah. yeah. So in wrapping it up, what is one tip or trick you can leave us with so we can all take one small step toward communicating better with our animals? The first step is just to recognize that they have an inner life. They're not just like fur and, you know, barking and eating and pooping, you know, walking. <laughs> they are not just these, you know, they are living beings, sentient beings. And from that choosing, say, I would like to communicate with you, even though I don't know how, even though I don't trust myself, that can come later. But it just starts with those first two steps of recognizing they have an inner life and they would like to communicate, choosing, intending to communicate. And then you can begin to just refine. So just start by being very quiet. You know, sit with your dog and just assume that your dog has something to say to me right now. And just you can even say, what would you like me to know right now? And just be very quiet. Don't put anything in. Don't add a thought. Just be in that receiving mode. And it's that receiving mode that allows you to hear. And then as you practice, you refine it. It gets clearer in the beginning. It won't be clear. What are your thoughts? What are your animal's thoughts? At first, it's kind of jumbled up. But if you're patient and practice it, you'll begin to tell the difference. I can feel the difference between when an animal says something and when I think something myself. It feels different. So what you have to do is tune your, it's like tuning a radio dial, the old time radio dial is very sensitive, right? You have to find that frequency where you're not broadcasting, you're not putting anything out, you're just in receive. Fantastic. I cannot believe how quickly this 45 minutes is gone. I think that we could talk about this for hours. Yeah. I appreciate you so much for coming on. And I would love to invite you back to talk Absolutely. some more about this. Anytime you want. We've got 33 principles, so you can have me on 33 times. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> All right, Jeannie, thank you so much. We will talk to you again soon. All right, thank you. Part of our animal soul contract is to help us to love more deeply, more fully, to lose, to experience loss, and to choose to love again when you're ready, Jeannie said. I've always believed that Shep came into my life to teach me what the word love means, because I really didn't know. And I also believe he left my world when he did, because he knew Bella was somewhere waiting to teach me even more. I used to ask him, do you get enough love? Today, almost every day, I ask Bella, do you get too much love? If she ever said yes, I don't know that I would change my ways and she would just have to suffer through me loving her too much. As I turn the pages of Jeannie's book, I realize this is the most helpful self-help book I've ever read. She speaks to animal lovers in a language we understand and gives us practical, actionable tips on how to improve our relationships with our companion animals. Y'all know I'm a skeptic about psychic communication and whatnot, but I give an open, judgment-free space to all to believe it and use it. I do, of course, believe that our animals communicate with us in their own way, and that, as I've mentioned many times before, they can be our greatest teachers if we open ourselves up to their messages. After all, that was the basis to episode 31, The Art of Lessons Learned, in which some of the member photographers at One Last Network join me to share what they've learned from their dogs. Oh, and a cat. Next week, oh man, you guys, I came up with this wild idea for a discussion. Are we limiting ourselves by labeling our beloved pets a soul dog or heart dog? And I couldn't think of a better person to talk to about this than Colleen Ellis, my friend, my mentor, pet loss grief pioneer, and the founder of Two Hearts Pet Loss Center. You don't want to miss it. Until then... I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, 
and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.